Ode on a Grecian Urn by John Keats, written in 1819. First of all, an ode is something of a celebration. It is a poem about something to celebrate, usually a thing, or sometimes a theme. A traditional ode can be a little boring, a little dum de dum uh, quite formal, but a bit more like a limerick than a poem. Keats wrote several odes, and he played with the form a bit. He did something different with the idea of an ode. Keats uh, wrote Ode on a Grecian Urn as one of two poems that he wrote about the El Elgin marbles, or at least uh, Ode on a Grecian Urn is thought to be inspired by seeing the Elgin marbles. The Elgin marbles are a series of stone friezes, marble friezes presumably, uh, that were taken from Greece by the seventh Earl of Elgin, uh, known as Thomas Bruce. Uh, and placed in the British Museum in the early part of the 19th century. And I think Keats and his friend Benjamin Hayden, who was an artist, went to see them fairly early on in their exhibition. The Elgin Marbles are quite controversial. They were then and they still are because the Greek nation believe that they should be returned to Greece, to the Acropolis Museum in Greece, where there is a space waiting for them. That topic is still under discussion. In fact, Keats was so impressed with the Elgin Marbles, he did sit, he did write an earlier poem called On Seeing the Elgin Marbles, but the ode on a Grecian urn is, is perhaps more detailed. Whether or not he actually saw a real Grecian urn is to be debated. It's more likely that this urn that he describes is a mix of Greek images that he saw in the museum and he's created a poem about a, a mythical, if you like, or a, a non-existent urn, but which refers to the tradition, the Greek tradition of, of making urns, which usually have friezes and other aspects depicting life on the side of them. When approaching a poem, uh, it's good to have a strategy, it, whether it's a poem you know or a poem that you've never seen before in an exam. If panic sets in, then the best thing to do is to go straight for this strategy. And the first thing to look at in any poem is rhyme scheme, followed by metre, and that will then probably tell you something about the form of the poem. So if we start with our strategy, uh, we'll be looking at rhyme scheme in this first stanza. And as you can see, it's A, B, that's how it's done. You simply list uh, the rhymes in order of the alphabet. So Ness and Express are AA, Time and Rhyme are BB, got a new one now, Shape, uh, which is C, makes sense. Here it comes. Uh, then another one, D, and another one, E. And then we go back, Both and Loth, shape and escape, arcady and ecstasy. Okay, so what that tells us is that this does have a very formal rhyme scheme. And so he's set himself quite a task. It is going to rhyme like this. And this kind of rhyme scheme is most usually associated with the form of poem known as the sonnet. Now a sonnet is usually a 14 line stanza, one 14 line stanza. Uh, but this is actually 10 lines uh, and more stanzas. So it's not specifically a um, sonnet, but it's using some of the form of a sonnet. So having established rhyme scheme and got some idea as to what the form of the poem might be, it's worth having a look at metre, which is basically beat. What is the rhythm of the poem? And in this poem, in these first two lines, if you count the syllables, you find you have 10 syllables per line. And that means five pairs of syllables, often known as five feet. So that gives you an idea of its metre. And that form of metre is, is called iambic pentameter, pent meaning 10. It's sometimes difficult to read poems exactly as the metre is formed, particularly with things like enjambment, where you don't follow 
the rhythm, but you follow the punctuation. So if you can look, Sylvan historian, comma, who can thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme. So you run through there and then the iambic pentameter can be difficult to follow. But if you've done the counting and the looking at the rhyme, you have enough to discuss how, how it is. So now we look at the poem itself and what it actually says. And in this case, Keats is talking directly to the urn itself. He addresses him with the archaic word thou. I'm not sure that they would have used thou that often in their uh, speech at the time. It might have been archaic even to him, but he is uh, using it and directly addressing the urn. To some extent personifying it. And of course he personifies it slightly more by calling it an unravished bride, which is a slightly violent image, referring to the fact that the urn is as yet unbroken, like a virgin bride. Quite a strong image, slightly violent image, but, but nevertheless it refers to that purity of the urn. And he calls it the bride of quietness, and you'll notice in the second line there's foster child of silence and slow time. That's probably a reference to the museum itself. Most museums are quiet and time can pass slowly and time has passed slowly in the sense that what you're looking at comes from another time. So there's quite a lot of reference in this stanza particularly to forests and rural scenes. That's because on the urn there are forests and rural scenes. Sylvan means a forest and much of, of what's depicted on the urn is pastoral. This also links with Temp or Dales of Arcady, a beautiful valley, a forest. The, the Temp or Dales of Arcady means a, a beautiful valley. And you get other rural um, lexical set in there, flowery tale, leaf fringed, leaf fringed, which is a compound adjective. So there's lots of ideas of beauty in the pastoral idyll. And then he ends this stanza with um, several quite high-paced rhetorical questions. What men or gods are these? What maidens loath? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and timbrels? What wild ecstasy? You, you can feel as you read that, that it, it's quite uh, declarative and quite, um, quite uh, strong in its pace and, and a little bit ecstatic. So if we move on from the, the, the rural theme of the first stanza, and we come to what might be going on that he can see on the urn. And he's talking about the fact that there will be people, there are people playing instruments. And he says, heard melodies are sweet. So what he means by that is the things that you can hear, music that you can hear is wonderful. But those unheard are sweeter. The imagination can create much more beautiful sounds, an, an idea of the music and the fun that the people are having on, as depicted on the urn. Imagination can be just as good. And he carries that on with the discussion of the sensual ear. Her melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore, ye soft pipes play on, not to the sensual ear but more endeared pipe to the spirit ditties of no tone. So he's more or less saying that even though you can't hear it, it is going to be more endearing, more beautiful than what you might hear, uh, despite the lack of tone. Now he reflects a bit on the, the youth shown on the urn and the fact, of course, that it is not alive. And so he juxtaposes what's going, the story of the life on the urn with the, the story of real life and reflects on the idea that they are frozen in time. Thy song, fair youth beneath the trees, thou canst not leave thy song, nor ever can those trees be bare. So the trees can never shed their leaves. Their time is not moving on. Bold lover, pre-modifier there, never, never canst thou kiss, though winning near the gold, yet do not grieve. So it, it, he, he talks about the fact that this, this young man who is about to kiss this beautiful girl can never do that because they are frozen in time. And yet he looks on the bright side and says, do not grieve because you will never age and die and she will not fade. Um, thou hast not thy bliss, forever wilt thou love and she be fair. So he is now reflecting on how this depicts something that happened and how it's frozen in time, like a photograph, and all that's left to him is to 
reflect on what that is, to watch and ask those questions as they are in the first stanza. What men or gods are these? What maidens loathe? Who were they? What did they do? How did they feel? Which is what you do in a museum. OK, so then we move on to a bit more repetition. There's a lot of repetition. Never, never. Uh, repetition here, happy, happy. And this stanza does link with the ideas of ecstasy in the first stanza. The, the nonverbal filler R also reflects that. And he refers again, bowels that cannot shed or leaves not ever bid the spring adieu. Um, he likes the word adieu, he uses it quite a lot. It's French. It's kind of a bit out of context here, but it has a romantic feel to it. So perhaps that's what he's referring to, that kind of romantic, traditionally romantic feel, rather than romantic in the sense of romantic poets, which is a slightly different thing. The romantic poets weren't talking about romantic love. They were talking about a, an ideal way to see the world. And then he carries on with more repetition. Oh, happy. Well, not oh, but happy, happy love. Using anaphora, there should be an A on the end of that uh, word on the video. Sorry about that. Um, using anaphora and discussing the idea that these characters have much to look forward to. This is a moment in time when life has not grown old, when pleasures have not grown jaded. And, and they are, in a sense, forever depicted in this youthful expectation with everything still ahead of them. Whereas those looking at the urn know that that's all past and maybe for them too, much of their life has, has passed them by and they too are looking back. And uh, the, the, the present participle panting kind of reflects that idea of ecstasy and anticipation, panting in anticipation. So the atmosphere of, the, of this stanza is ecstatic, happy, all about expectation and love and passion and gives a, a sort of whole, quite slightly sensual, sexual element to it. A little bit of alliteration that leaves the heart high, sorrowful and cloyed, a burning forehead and a parching tongue. Again, more use of present participles, the ing words, and a compound adjective in, uh, in high, sorrowful. And uh, and this perhaps offers a, a, a polysemic meaning with lots of meanings. He's looking at people having a great time and he's sort of left high, sorrowful and cloyed, a burning forehead, wanting the same thing, a parching tongue. He is burning for love, he is parched for it. And yet these characters enjoy it while he can only look on at their still life on the freeze on the urn. Then the mood changes a bit. You get another rhetorical question at the beginning of the next stanza. Who are these coming to the sacrifice? And, and the, the mood has changed because the scene on the urn has changed. He's been looking at a sort of party scene and tambourines and pipes and people kissing and dancing and all that sort of thing. And now he's looking at something slightly different. He's looking at an expected uh, sacrifice. And the semantic field of the, of the um, stanza changes. So you have more reference to religion, pious soul, even peaceful citadel and green altar. These are all offering um, a, a lexical field, semantic field of uh, religion, priest as well. So we get the idea that this is now not just a party or the, the scene depicted on the urn has moved on from a party to a religious uh, moment, to a religious ritual. Uh, and it's it's a sacrifice, and it's a young cow. Leads thou that heifer, lowing at the skies, and all her silken flanks with gar garlands dressed. So there's a little cow that's being taken to the altar, the green altar, to be sacrificed. So it's it's not such a fun stanza. It refers perhaps to the traditions and practices of days gone by and speculates a little on how that is for the for the people and for the the heifer herself and all that the tone changes one side of the urn is full of love and parties and the other is full of sacrifice and and desertion the the heifer with her silken flanks the primodifier silken 
uh, creates quite a strong image. And there is a marble panel in the British Museum, which the British Museum suggests is the one that he based this particular stanza on, rather than a specific urn. And uh, that's why we have this sense of sacrifice and desertion. In the last two lines of the stanza, we get quite a lot of sibilance. Will silent be, and not a soul, why thou art desolate, can air return. It's just a sense of silence, a sense of shushing, maybe. And it slows the pace down, so we are more reflective in this stanza. So in the final stanza, he starts talking about an attic. Um, he doesn't mean an attic, he means an attic shape, which is the triangular shape typical of arches in in Athens. So he's making reference to Greek architecture. Uh, he's got another nonverbal filler, O attic shape, and exclamation marks, fair attitude with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought with forest branches and trodden weed. Breed means braid of hair, so they've got long hair. Of marble men and maidens, a uh, nice bit of alliteration there with forest branches and the trodden weed, thou silent form. So now he's back to addressing the urn itself, the fact that it's silent, it's inanimate, and everything he's thinking and writing about this poem is speculation he can't know. And that's what you do when you go to a museum, you stand and you look at these things and you wonder, and often it's in silence. And really, the objects themselves can only express to you what's what their history is through their form. No one can explain everything exactly. It, you may be right about what you see, or it may have completely different meaning. And, and he goes back, in a sense, to the idea of the rural scene. But this time, instead of calling it a sylvan forest, he calls it a cold pastoral. And, and makes that quite a big noun phrase and exclamation, because it is cold pastoral gives it capital letters and starts to reflect on age that the fact that all the people involved in the making of this urn being depicted on this urn who molded it they shall remain he then goes on to speculate about the people who are on this urn and the people who are looking at this urn so when old age shall this generation waste thou shalt remain so he's talking again to the urn and saying i'm standing here looking at and looking at it in 1817, 18, 19, round about then, I think, and the urn will remain. And in fact, the frieze that they think he based the sacrificial stanza on, the stanza of the, of the heifer, is still in the British Museum. So you and I could go and see it. It remains a cold form, a cold pastoral, and thousands of people who have been and gone and looked at it have moved on, as Keats did, of course, at a very young age. So he's reflecting on that, thou shalt remain, and he wrestles with the knowledge that he will be gone, but the urn will remain, and others will stand there and speculate about who these people were, and what they did, and what is the meaning of their sacrifice and their rituals. And then he finishes off um, the whole poem with a, a slightly controversial saying which he puts in quotes beauty is truth truth beauty which is a kind of paralleling of language it, it says the same thing again but in a slightly different way it's declarative for some reason it's in quotes that could be a quote that he heard from someone else or an attempt to reflect something on the urn is it written on this imaginary urn that he has one's reminded of Shelley's Ozymandias where written at the bottom of the of the statue now fallen and uh, lone and level sands there is uh, a, an inscription which says look on my works you mighty in despair you wonder whether uh, he's doing the same thing here just pretending that there is something written on the urn uh, not a lot of people like this phrase some critics have been quite harsh about it T.S. Eliot who was a very great modern poet felt it spoilt the ode that it was a bit trite and uh, maybe that's something that you think as well. So it is hard to tell whether Keats was quoting something that he'd heard or whether he had made this quote up and expected us to believe it was there on the urn, which in itself probably didn't exist, but was a conglomeration of a variety of 
friezes and sculptures he'd seen at the British Museum when he went to see the Elgin marbles. One of the things that preoccupied Keats was the idea of what he called negative capability. After a walk with some friends, he wrote to his brothers, Tom and George, that he had been preoccupied with this idea of how human beings were capable of, of understanding the negative without, in effect, going mad. He said, I mean negative capability. That is, when a man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. So, basically what he's saying is, how do human beings live with the idea of illness and death and not go mad? And this knowledge of death, of truth and beauty, and beauty is truth, may be an attempt by him to reflect on negative capability. There is beauty and there is truth, and the two things don't seem to fit together very well, and yet we hold them together in our lives without going mad.